Hi there, this is your host, Daniel, and welcome to the second Talking Insomnia episode where we connect with Michael Schwartz. He shares some insights about insomnia as well as his work on intensive sleep retraining, which is, in my opinion, the only potential quick fix to insomnia. Enjoy. So with us today, we have Michael Schwartz. Uh, thanks so much, Mike, for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So me and Mike have been, uh, I think we first connected on Twitter and then we met up in real life uh, as well and uh, always have a really good time whenever I chat with Mike. So really happy he's willing to come on and uh, tell, tell us, Mike, how, uh, tell us the story. Like, how did you get into like um, uh, treating insomnia and, and all that? Sure thing. Okay, so um, when I got out of college in the mid 80s, uh, I had a degree in psychology and I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I kind of fell into this this lab, uh, that, this sleep lab down in Southern California, which was kind of a new thing at the time. And I, was, I started working nights and doing sleep recordings. And I did that for a year or so and got registered. I became a registered sleep tech. And we were using polygraphs and all that kind of cool old tech stuff. And then... Um, then I went to grad school and got a, a graduate degree in psychology, and then I kind of started managing labs, and uh, I was doing some a little bit of uh, research assistantship here and there, and then I kind of went back to my, uh, you know, I got out of management, which is probably a good thing for me, <laughs> yeah. um, and then it, around, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, I, I kind of went back to my roots, I went back to um, working with specifically uh, patients that were struggling not just with sleep apnea and the more common sleep disorders, but also with insomnia. And we, we had a doctor of a lab that um, I'm still with, actually, in, in Oregon, where um, he was very interested in helping people because he knew just treating sleep apnea didn't always resolve an insomnia issue. And so I, was, I kind of started this little program, kind of an educational program, and it's kind of grown from there. Um, and I've since gone on to become certified in clinical sleep health, uh, which is a newer certification that uh, became available about three or four years ago. And actually, I teach all of this stuff through um, a university in, uh, in Southern Oregon. So it's kind of in my blood, and, uh, and I really enjoy working with people who specifically struggle with a chronic insomnia condition and i'm yeah, lucky yeah, enough yeah. to do that absolutely and, and and so you what was your thought initially when you got a you know a degree in psychology were you already kind of thinking of insomnia or, or not at all not really at all not initially I, I have sort of a vague memory of taking a class that talked about sleep for you know maybe one of its sections and this is back in you know probably the early 80s um, and I remember thinking it was kind of interesting, and it's, but it's not really a totally clear memory. It wasn't like, oh, this is great, and I want to just pursue this. But afterwards, after doing sleep studies and really seeing how, you, how, you know, how sleep made such a big impact on people's lives and how you can help people, and it was very rewarding. Even as a technologist, I thought, I want to be in this field. I want to help people with this because I know a lot about it, and I, I feel like I can educate people fairly well. It's kind of in my blood. And that's just kind of what I've been doing, and I really enjoy doing it. And, and was, it like, do you, was it like this one certain patient that you know, made you think like, wait a minute, I, I want to go into insomnia, or was it like a more of a gradual process over time? It was more of a gradual process. It really was. Um, I think uh, you know, the, the sleep apnea patients are kind of the, the, you know, the majority of patients seen in sleep centers, as you know. Yeah. Um, and the insomnia ones, it's, it's, it's like it's a – um, it's a whole different approach. And I, I just kind of found myself gravitating towards that. So it wasn't like a specific patient. It was just yeah. kind of a realization that I really enjoy psychology and behavioral modification and education. And it all kind of went together. And that's kind of what I'm doing now. That's awesome. Very good. We have uh, quite a lot to talk about, but um, uh, share with us uh, uh, on, a, like on, a, on a weekly basis, let's say, how much of your time is dedicated to uh, you know, helping people with insomnia? Oh, my gosh. Um, probably uh, about 80% of my time. Oh, really? It is that much? Yeah. During cool. the week. And um, it, uh, it's a program I run, an educational program uh, at a clinical sleep center. 
and teaching uh, people, young students oftentimes, um, in the courses that I, uh, I run a program uh, in a college that does that. And uh, uh, we teach not just about sleep recordings, but also about sleep education, the clinical yeah. sleep health part of it. And then on my own, I've uh, done other things and uh, uh, have a, a website. And as you know, I've been doing some podcasting. It's kind of a new thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I wrote an app and different things like that. Yeah, I yeah, know. We, we're going to get more into those things, too. But uh, leading up to my question here, so you obviously do, you know, work a lot with insomnia, have a lot of insight in this field. So uh, what would you say, like, if you pick this one thing for people that struggle with insomnia, like the core, like the most important thing, the one, like the, the insomnia insight you have, what would that be? Oh, boy. Okay. Um, I thought about this because I thought you were probably going to ask me that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, okay. So um, probably when I thought about it, I took a few moments and I thought about it. And I thought, um, as a, just a general um, thing, it's very important for people to understand, especially if you're struggling with your sleep, with a chronic type of insomnia, to recognize that how people think really changes from daytime to nighttime. And there's actual physiological changes in brain function that make a person more susceptible to um, thinking kind of emotionally or being more reactive about things, um, not quite as logical about things. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, kind of higher end thinking areas of the brain and then deeper, older structures in the brain that all kind of change when mm -hmm. nighttime comes around. And so I like to remind my patients or not remind, I basically, no one's really heard that if they're a patient of mine, <laughs> right. um, but I just let them know that brain function changes. And there's a couple old sayings that kind of bear witness to that. And one would be, uh, you know, I, I think my grandmother told me a long time ago, or maybe my mom that, you know, you, you, you never make a big decision at night. Like, yeah. where does, where does that phrase come from? It comes from the realization people had a long time ago that you're kind of impulsive at night. Yeah. Like you might not make the most logical, rational decision about something. And so, you know, and then the, the kind of a, a sister uh, saying to that would be every problem at 2 a.m. is always bigger than it is at 2 p.m. These, these kinds of phrases are, are just, they, they recognize the change in how we think. And just letting a person know, someone who's struggling with chronic insomnia, letting them know that there's kind of a bit of an uphill battle with that, it really kind of helps. They realize like, okay, so this is just kind of a normal thing to think like this. And then we go on and we talk about strategies to kind of help with that. So just the realization of that, I think, helps a lot, actually. So, so to kind of distill that thought, um, uh, knowing that for a lot of people, you know, the brain works differently at night and you tend to kind of worry more at night and be more preoccupied with things at night, just that knowing that is, can help people? Yes, I've, I have found that to be true. Mm -hmm. Just first knowing that and then talking about simple strategies, you know, writing down things during the day and organizing your thoughts and, and you know, getting your mind in a more kind of relaxed state as the evening progresses, these kinds of behavioral type strategies can really help with that natural change in brain function. So it doesn't take over and become this huge worry rumination experience that a lot of people who struggle with chronic insomnia do experience. Absolutely. I, that was great. I, I, I have never really, uh, that was an insight to me too. So definitely thanks so much for sharing that. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> now, um, Here's another thing I've been really looking forward to talking to you about. Um, as you know, with many things in life, and I, you know, it's often helpful to, to think about like appetite and weight and things like that and when we talk about sleep as well. And here's another one. Uh, we, we all know what to do kind of to lose weight, you know, exercise and diet. And, 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 and there is really no quick fix, but a lot of people are looking for a quick fix. And oftentimes... You know, I find myself telling people that too, like the same thing with if you had insomnia for a long while, there's really no quick fix. You have to do these like cognitive behavioral therapy techniques that we often talk about. But perhaps there is a quick fix. <laughs> and that's what I want to use you to talk about. Are you, do you, do you know where, what I'm alluding to? I do know what you're alluding <laughs> to. Yeah, I think you're talking about intensive sleep retraining. Exactly. So for everybody out there listening, um, Mike told me about this thing called intensive sleep retraining, I, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, and I was really intrigued. I read about it, and I feel it's kind of a radical but really interesting way to, to approach insomnia. So, Mike, tell us more about intensive sleep retraining. Okay. So 
Um, there's a group of uh, researchers, sleep researchers down in South Australia who um, were in, in the mid 2000s, 2007, I think is when a pilot study went out. They we were looking at people with chronic insomnia, mostly sleep, trouble falling asleep, what we call kind of the classic sleep onset insomnia type of person. And they said, you know, um, a big probably most supported part of this cognitive behavioral therapy set of instructions that we have, um, the most supported part seems to be stimulus control, which is developing a stronger association between your bed and sleep. So the standard instructions, you know, don't stay in bed awake for a long time during the night, get out of bed, get up at the same time every morning, don't take naps, only go to bed when you're truly sleepy. These kinds of standard instructions, what we call stimulus control. Um, they said, you know, it, it, it's really effective but it might even be able to be more effective. And in part that was looked at because some people, if, if they don't have a good sleep coach or a clinician to help them, they can, they, it can take a few weeks sometimes, you know, even like a couple weeks, two, three weeks of really, really strong adherence to that for it to really start to work effectively. And so these researchers said, I wonder if it can be done faster. And so really it's kind of classical conditioning. It's, it's Pavlovian conditioning is really what this is. So they said, okay, let's take some, let's recruit some people with chronic insomnia, mostly the sleep onset type of insomnia. And let's say, you know what, let's have them come to the lab and for 24 hours on the half hour, starting at bedtime and then ending at the next bedtime, let's have them try to take a short nap, put them down, turn off the lights, say, try to fall asleep, give them, you know, 20 minutes or so, and then come in. And then whether or not the person fell asleep or not, and they knew because they had the brainwave recording thing going at the time, and they, so they knew if they fell asleep or not, they would go in the room and ask the person, do you think you just fell asleep? Do you think you were asleep? And the person would say yes or no. They would make their best guess. And then they were immediately given the correct answer. So it's kind of almost like a biofeedback thing. And they did that on the half hour for 24 hours. So it added, ended up to be roughly 50 of what they were calling sleep trials. And they found that people not only started to fall asleep faster as their 24 hour intensive sleep retraining experience went on, but they also got better at perceiving it, whether they were falling asleep or not. Right. And it was really interesting. It was almost, it was kind of tapping into like learning theory about what might be going on here. And so then they did a bigger study. That was 2007. 2012, they said, okay, let's, let's recruit more subjects, make it a more robust study, and we're going to have one group of subjects, and everyone had insomnia. It was like all insomnia, chronic insomnia patients. The, one group, they said, let's just do stimulus control, the traditional instead of instructions and follow up to make sure that they're doing the stimulus control instructions. Let's have a group do intensive sleep retraining for 24 hours. And then we'll have a group do both. One group did intensive sleep retraining and then another, and also did, I think it was four weeks of stimulus control instructions. So they kind of set it up to see which group might work out the best. And what they found when they did the same 24 hour routine, and I should make a side note here, they did, the people were a little bit sleep deprived when they came into the lab to start the 24 hours. They, they on purpose restricted their time in bed to five hours the night before at home. So um, they probably did actigraphy to verify that, if I remember right. So they were kind of sleeping when they showed up, and they were going to embark on 24 hours of sleep trials on the half hour. What they found was that the group that did intensive sleep retraining for 24 hours fared as well in their, in their abatement of insomnia as the group that did just stimulus control. But they did that for four weeks. Right. And so they went, oh, interesting. It's kind of the same effect. Then they looked at the group that did both intensive sleep retraining and stimulus control. So they did 24 hours of intensive sleep retraining, continued on with four weeks of stimulus control. That group actually did the best. They did significantly better than both of the other groups. And so it's really kind of interesting. It's like it kind of enhanced the whole classical conditioning aspect of stimulus control. And then they looked at them, I think, six months down the road, and the improvements held. And they that led them to kind of theorized like more more than just pure sleep de deprivation was going on here because you could argue if you deprive someone of a lot of sleep you know restrict them at home this 24-hour sleep intensive sleep retraining they didn't get much sleep they only let them sleep for about three minutes before they'd go in and wake them up so they didn't accumulate much sleep over the 24 hours you could argue well of course they're going to start sleeping better they're so sleep deprived well this kind of 
answered that question that, no, there was something else going on. And they theorized that it was actual conditioning. It was kind of a learning experience that was happening. The people learned what falling asleep felt like. And they thought that seems to be a very important component for someone with chronic insomnia is learning what sleep feels like getting sleepy, falling asleep. Like a lot of us kind of take that for granted. I know when I'm getting sleepy, but people with chronic insomnia, a lot of times they don't really perceive that very well. So, okay. So that's all intensive sleep retraining. All right. Yeah. yeah no, so, this, is, this is super interesting. You know, I think we should, we, there's some more things I want to go over here, but yeah. just for, for our listeners here to clarify, just briefly clarify, you know, what Mike is talking about is like stimulus control is, I think the core principle there is like, if you can't fall asleep, you get out of your bed, don't go to back, back in, unless you feel sleepy again. And then uh, going back to this intensive sleep training, just to clarify, um, they had people that, you know, on, let's say the night before training, they were only allowed to spend, let's say five hours in bed. So they probably spent, slept like, you know, four or five hours or something like that. Then, you know, uh, 24 hours later, they come into the sleep lab and then basically every time they fall asleep, they're only allowed to sleep like, you know, three, four minutes. Uh, am I right? Yeah, about it was technically three minutes. So oftentimes over like, you know, it, let's say you do like 50 trials, then a lot of people have actually like fallen asleep 50 times and quickly been awake and fall asleep, awake and fall asleep like, like, like that, correct? Yes. So, uh, so that's, you know, and when I heard about this, this is a very interesting way to approach insomnia. But one thing I also talked about was like, you know how many people say like, I seem to have like, I forgot how to, I, for, I, I forgot how to fall asleep. I don't know how to fall asleep again. And, and then intensive sleep training can, can actually kind of like make you remember what it feels like to fall asleep like multiple times, right? Right, exactly. It's very much kind of a boot camp idea. It is really at its core just... No, there's no, there's no, there's no fluff going on here. It is just right. pure, 100%, you know, stimulus control. It is associating the bed with falling asleep. But the the, the important component was the improved perception of falling That's asleep. That's exactly right. Which right. they it, felt led to the improvement of earned Fall asleep or not, and then they were given feedback like, did they actually fall asleep or not? Yeah, it was immediate feedback. So then, do you want me to finish the rest of the story? Yeah, yeah, please do. Okay, so the rest of the story is this. So I read the 2012 paper about a couple months later. I barely even, I didn't even notice it when it first came out. So I saw it and I read it. I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. It's psychology, it's insomnia. You know, I, it kind of resonated with me. And I'm reading it and I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating. And then there was a, a review article that, or a commentary by doctors um, Arthur Spielman and Paul Glavinsky. I think uh, it's the late Dr. Spielman, if I remember right. Um, they're two huge insomnia researchers. I mean, they were the three P model people. You know, I mean, they were these were just exactly. two huge names, and they reviewed this research, and they were they were like, this is like really good stuff. We need to make this available. And the problem with the research is that they needed a lab. So you know, right away, it's like you're you know, it's a huge kind of thing to. So basically, arrange. the question kind of becomes like. How do we make this type of technique available to people that um, that you know can do this at home essentially right that's it, that's almost verbatim what they said, and they were almost implying like someone who doesn't even have to know anything about sleep they just need to know how to develop something that can allow this procedure to happen at home and I read their review in that last paragraph. And I stare, I remember this vividly. I remember staring at that paragraph for about five minutes going, are they saying what I think they're saying? <laughs> and then I thought, you know what? I want to do this. And so I quickly started researching everything and seeing, is it, you know, what's going on? Where is this going? And I didn't really find anything. And I thought. So I at didn't... this point, sorry yeah. to interrupt, Mike, but at this point you're thinking, how could I, you know, make this available to people, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Because I knew the prevalence of insomnia. It's a huge problem. We all know that. And I thought, you know, this could enhance CBTI. That was really what I was thinking. I was like, I don't know if this is on its own going to, you know, just replace everything. But it could certainly enhance CBTI. That's what the research showed. And that was a pretty good study in 2012. And I said, I'm going to figure out something. And I, my first thought was a gadget. I'm going to create a device, an actual thing. Right. And I thought, and this is where you asked my wife about that. It just was crazy. I was, <laughs> I was, I, I came up with the idea like, okay, when you get sleepy, what happens? 
And um, I remember asking the doctors I work with, like, what happens when you get sleepy? Besides your brainwave changing, because we need like amplifiers to, to record that. What, what happens? And they go, well, you know, and then one of them said, you, you like drop stuff. You can't hold on. And I go, yeah, that's right. You drop stuff. And I said, I'm going to develop, I thought I'm going to develop something where you get sleepy and you drop it. And then somehow after a couple minutes, it alerts you. Right. And then it asks you if you fell asleep or not. And then, but you know, it, it, so I was kind of going that route, like a device, yeah, an so, actual electronic. So like, I mean, I yeah, got the like original you, one. At least you hold this device when you're going to bed, yeah. you drop it, and then it asks you, like, did you fall asleep? Something like that, right? I guess so, or it notes it, because if you drop it, then technically you kind of did fall asleep. Exactly. So it, right. it's like it doesn't really have to ask you, it just needs to know if it was dropped or not. But then it needs to kind of alert you after a couple minutes so you don't just lay there and right. sleep another two hours before you realize what's going on. So, I, oh, my God, I have the original thing I ever developed, and I, I had it at a local community college. I had their, um, what do you call those things, 3D printers make, yeah. like, this ball, this, like, <laughs> with, with, like, a, a little mini circuit board inside with an A battery or something like that. And it was, like, this student who was helping me with it, and he thought it was just crazy. He thought it was, it was so interesting to him. He's like, wow, really? What do you think this is for? Oh, and so – Anyways, long, long story short there, it, basically the bottom line is it, it was too heavy. Everything – I tried to make it as light as possible, but you were always sort of – it startled you when you dropped it. That was the, that was the thing. It, it, uh -huh. and I didn't – I couldn't have a startle response. And then I went back to the research, and I looked up, and there was some really interesting stuff done in the 60s about like perception of falling asleep, which has always been kind of an interesting thing to me. And they were saying like – you know, if you wake someone up in stage one sleep, they're not always going to think that they were asleep, that light transitional start of sleep stage that we call sleep. But if you wake someone up, you know, like roughly half the time, they're going to say, I don't really think I was asleep. And you're looking at the brainwaves going, well, you were. Um, so I was looking at what other things happen. And sure, they were, they were talking about muscle loss, muscle tone, uh, you know, decreasing. But and they said that was kind of variable exactly when that happened. And then I came, then I read the most interesting part, which was when you when you get your first sign of like stage two, like a sleep spindle, the first one at that moment, your auditory threshold goes way up. In other words, your your perception of sound around you like goes away. Basically, you don't and hear you don't so hear things anymore. When okay. you transition from a very superficial and light sleep into a little bit more solid sleep, yeah. you don't you don't hear as well. Yeah, because like you know, stage one is kind of back and forth. Wake one, wake one. As we all know, people who have done you know sleep testing, you see that. And then when you get to that spindle, it's like that's when things kind of stabilize, and they call stage two kind of stable sleep, or there's different terms for it. But I thought I I need to come up with something that detects when a person hits stage two as soon as they hit stage two. And in the research, that's kind of why they chose that Australian group. They chose three minutes. They didn't wait for a spindle. They just said three minutes, and we'll just leave it at that. And I said, I need something that's going to send the user a sound, a tone or something that they have to respond to. And then when they stop responding to it, boom, they fell asleep. They're asleep, yeah. And they're more, in, more than just like light fragmented transitional stage one sleep. They've kind of achieved a moment of medium depth sleep. Like it just kicked in. So I thought, you know what? I can do this with an app. So I changed directions, said goodbye to the community college guy who was helping me. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to try to do an app. And that led me into finding these programmers. And, and, you know, some of them were overseas and some of them weren't. And I was up until one in the morning. I was basically giving myself insomnia to try to create a device that can help people with insomnia, which is all very ironic. And so I came up with this app. And it's called Sleep on Q. Uh, and... It's, it's kind of a play on words like, you know, sleep on cue. You can't sleep on cue. But we talk about sleep cues as being signs of being sleepy. And so I just came up with that name. And so the, the app, it, it, you hold the phone in your hand. You go around bedtime, ideally after a bad night of sleep. So you're already kind of sleep deprived. I'm trying to follow the original research, basically. You go to bed around bedtime or so. You're starting to feel kind of sleepy. You lay down. You hold the phone in your hand. And... You let yourself drift off, and the app is sending you an occasional tone, like a monotone. It kind of sounds like a distant foghorn, and there wasn't any scientific anything to that. It was just, to me, that kind of made the most sense. I have it kind of a waxing and waning pattern, so it's kind of a foghorn that kind of fades off. The whole tone is about a second, I think, or half, three-quarters of a second. 
And you respond to it by shaking your phone because the phone has an accelerometer in it. And that was really the big key. I needed an accelerometer. So the, you shake the phone if you hear the tone. And then when the phone detects that you're not shaking it anymore, when you hear a tone, like a tone is emitted and you don't respond, the app says, oh, you do that a couple times in a row, you're asleep. Okay? Exactly. Then the phone vibrates like three times. It just it doesn't do a sound. It just vibrates. So three vibrations in a row. And this is right after the person has fallen asleep. So they're probably not, they probably haven't dropped their phone or anything like that. And I never had a pro, never saw a problem with that. Um, it vibrates three times. It alerts, so it alerts them. Got Maybe, it. but, but it also has, and just a side note, it has a backup amount of time where it gives you to fall asleep. So if you hadn't fallen asleep, it's still going to vibrate. Okay. So whether you fall asleep or not, it's going to vibrate. You look at the screen and I did try to program it where, you know, I got as much of that bluish light out as possible. It's all kind of orangey brown color, dim screen. I did as much of that as I could because we all know that that kind of light is bad for you. But this is training. It's kind of like, you know, we're not trying to enhance, you know, a night of sleep right here. We're trying to train you. So, okay, so you look at the screen and the screen simply says, do you think you fell asleep? Yes or no? And you tap yes or no. And then it tells you the right answer right afterwards. So you get immediate feedback. Then the app says, hey, get out of bed for a couple minutes. And that's what they did in the research. They had them get out of bed for 10 minutes and then back to bed. So I said, let's just make it three minutes. I think that's enough. Just get up, stretch, maybe you know, go to the bathroom, have a sip of water, come back to bed, do another sleep trial. Yeah. And then you keep going really as long as you want. And I kind of suggest, because I have the app programmed in a way that you can do a lot of sleep trials in a, in a condensed amount of time, you don't really need to do this for 24 hours. Most of the users, they just do it for, they'll do like 15 sleep trials or 20 sleep trials. And then they're, real, they're, they're kind of sick of doing it. And so they put the phone down and then they just sleep for the rest of the night. And they do it occasionally. Like if they ever had a rough night of sleep, they might do some sleep training. And it's kind of like, it, you know, it's like, it's like basic training for insomnia. It is just at the core of classical conditioning. Well, so when, did app, you, uh, sorry to when did you when did you launch the app or when did you when did it come out? When 20 I think it hit the the I didn't in uh, iOS the iPhone version first I think it was in 2014. Okay. And then in 2015 I think I came out with the Android version. Okay, okay. And so far like what what's the feedback you've gotten from from people? Really good. I mean it's like four or five stars kind of thing. One yeah. guy didn't care for it because but I don't think he quite understood how it was supposed to be used. He thought sure, you sure. know like the tones keep waking or the the vibrations wake me up. Like some people think like you're supposed to drift off and fall asleep and then you're supposed to just sleep the rest of the night. And it's like no, it's going to wake you up and ask if you think you fell asleep. It's training, right? <laughs> it's yeah. So I totally get it. Like, a lot of people probably want that app that just puts them to sleep. <laughs> yeah, and as we know, that really doesn't exist doesn't very well, right? And like something might work for a while, and then it's going to kind of, you know, lose effect in this. So this is just training. It's training your own brain to recognize what falling asleep feels like, and it, it yeah, it's been really helpful. I mean, I've had some users do it for twenty four hours. They'll do the full trial thing, just like the research, and yeah, 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 but it, and it it. It, it adds I, the, the app also just I'll just finish up with it. It adds like a, a bit of um, uh, am I trying to say variable training in a sense, in the sense that each of the sleep trials, the duration of the trial changes based on whether you fell asleep or not the previous trial. So in other words, if you fell asleep during a sleep trial and you you know gives you the question, do you think you fell asleep? Yes or no? You guess, given the right answer, all that. You come back for another sleep trial. The next sleep trial is going to be a little bit shorter than the previous one if you fell asleep on the previous one. Does that make sense? Yeah, so tell me again. So, it, okay, so if you, you want to do that? If, yeah, if you fall asleep during a, one of these sleep trials, that I was yeah. just, the next sleep trial that you do is going to be slightly shorter. And the idea is that it's kind of challenging you. It's saying, okay, well, you know, your last sleep trial was 12 minutes and you fell asleep. So this one, unbeknownst to you really, we don't, we don't tell you, it's just gonna be a little bit shorter. It might be like 11 minutes. Ah. And then if you have a sleep trial in which you didn't fall asleep, it adds a little time to the next sleep trial. Got so it. your sleep trial time is variable. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. so after someone really, does- I got it, so you can't really predict. You know, It's not like you can learn how the app works and kind of just uh, right. cheat, cheat the system, if you will. 
Yeah, I mean, if every sleep trial was a half an hour, let's say, well, what if you keep falling asleep in like three minutes and three right. minutes, four minutes? You know, it's kind of, well, what's the, there's, there's nothing, there's no, you're always no if you fell asleep. I mean, it, it's going to be, you're not going to learn as well. But if it, if it changes that duration of time it gives you, it adds a different element to it that kind of enhances the training. And then the last thing was this research group. I met some of the primary investigators at a sleep meeting in 2015. And we ended up talking for about an hour and a half. He had never really heard of me, and he thought it was fascinating what I was doing. He's asking me all these questions, and I'm asking him all these questions. And um, so they ended up doing – they had a couple PhD uh, students that were using intensive sleep retraining, and they needed my app. And they needed it programmed a little bit differently for kind of research purposes. And so I went through all that, and they used my app, and they actually validated it. They came out with a pilot study to validate it. And so I have that on my website if anyone wants to see it. Um, and that was great to hear. I was so happy. It was like, wow, here's these guys, these original researchers, and they're looking at my app and they're thinking, yeah, you, this is a viable way to do intensive re re sleep research, excuse me, intensive sleep retraining at home, just like the Spielman and Glavinsky uh, yeah, review yeah. article said. Totally. I, I remember reviewing that article. Really, really cool. And I'll put, of course, I'll, I'll put the, you know, the link to your web page and the name of the app and everything in the, in the, in the notes to this uh, episode here. Very cool. So, um, those, you know, let, let me just pick your brain a little bit more about um, one thing you told me. So uh, we had a conversation, I think it was about a month ago now, but um, where we, we often tell people that, you know, if you can't get out of bed, then, uh, or sorry, if, you, if you're not falling asleep, then do get out of bed, which is hard for a lot of people. And you had kind of a, another take on that, another thing that people can do if, it's, if they really physically, if it's hard for them to get out of bed. If it's hard for them to get out of bed, like with a mobility issue or something like that? Or, or, or they're just like really, really tired and they don't want to get out of bed. If they're really tired and they don't want to get out of bed, but they realize that they're not sleepy. Um, well, the, I think the simplest thing is to have a place already set up in another part of your house, in the living room or wherever, or even just next to your bed, but out of bed, have a place set up where there's something there to keep you warm and something to do and maybe a little snack or maybe like some herbal tea that you made before you went to bed and you put it in a thermos and it's already there waiting for you. Kind of that idea of having a place set up so you're not fumbling around for things to do in the middle of the night. You keep it all very simple. I think that's probably the best. Oh, okay, got it. The best no, that, strategy. That, that, that's a good one. That's a that's a that's a good input. Uh, I was kind of like, let's see if you could remember this. I, I, you told me that another thing you could do is kind of like, uh, kind of like, um, I was I don't, wanna, I don't want you to mentally, but like uh, in your mind, you yes. know, in your mind, you see if you can go where somewhere, something like that, right? Remember that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what I was referring to, I remember having that conversation with you. you it was the question. The question is, how do you know if you're not sleepy? How do you know you're laying there in bed? How do you know if you should get out of bed? Right. You know, exactly. The common instruction, you know, is, oh, if you haven't fallen asleep in 20 minutes, get out of bed. Well, by definition, that kind of starts you with like, you know, the stopwatch in your head or the clock next to you. It's kind of a performance anxiety situation. And so what I suggest people do is this. They're in bed and they're wondering if they should get out of bed. They're kind of like. I don't know if I'm sleepy or not. Maybe am I sleepy? Maybe I'll just stay here. And they're kind of going instead of in, instead of going through these mental gymnastics to figure out if they're sleepy or not. I simply say just do one of the most human things that we do, and that is use visualization imagery. Engage what what do they call it? Your mind's eye, and you do that when you're in bed. And if that is not an easy thing to do, like if that's difficult, you know, you're trying to picture like that proverbial vacation in Hawaii or, you know, a great experience somewhere from previously or anything, you're trying to see it in your mind. If you can't, if it's difficult to do, you've just, you've just answered the question, am I sleepy? And the answer is no, you're not sleepy if that's difficult to do. Exactly. I think, I think I thought that was a really good one. I made like uh, on my YouTube channel, I made a, a whole episode about that. Like how, so yeah. just over it one more time, like, you know, somebody's in bed, they wake up or they haven't fallen asleep and they're like, ah, they told me I should get out of bed if I can't fall asleep again. But I don't know, should I or should I not? And then if you can imagine yourself in a nice place, if you can, can drift off in your mind, you can yep. probably stay in bed. If you can't, you, you, you're probably going to get frustrated. You should just get out of bed, right? Exactly. It's like the degree of difficulty of 
visualizing something is your litmus test for whether you should be in bed or not. Exactly. Wow, that, that's, that's great. Um, uh, obviously, we have a lot. I had a lot, a lot, another point, another couple of points <laughs> I want to go over with you. But uh, that just goes to say that uh, we should do this again and, uh, and, do, uh, and, and talk about more things that will be helpful to our listeners. I would love to. I would love to. And I'm really, really enjoying your YouTube videos and the podcast and everything. I, I look forward to them and really am, am, I'm, I'm learning a lot. And um, it's, it's a great service that you're doing. It really is. Uh, sure. It's, it's been really fun. And like, I, we can end on that, on, on that by the way, um, that you actually started a podcast recently, right? I did, yeah. So, um, and, and you inspired me, by the way. I, I was watching your videos, and I said, I don't know if I want to do a video because I don't. I'm kind of uncomfortable and sort of shy and whatever. So I thought, you know, I'll try a podcast, and and I, it, you know, I've done. I think I, re- I recorded one today. I think it was my sixth or seventh one that I've done, and it's kind of, um, you know, technologically, it was a lot of things to figure out. I think I'm older than you are and, and, you know, technology and I'm, I'm like my mid fifties. It's kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, yeah, I, I developed an app, but I didn't program the app kind of. Thing. So figuring out the technology has been probably the most challenging, but every, every episode, I think it gets a little better sound wise and my just speaking clarity and, and getting my notes organized and all of that. So it's really been rewarding because it feels very natural to just talk about these kinds of things because I've done that for, you know, 30 plus years in different settings. And it's just, I feel like it's, instead of writing a book, I'm just going to do all these podcasts and it's really kind of enjoyable. Absolutely. I, I really enjoy them and um, really enjoyed having you on here, Mike. And, uh, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk some more very soon. I really look forward to it. Thank you so much for having me on. You got it.